and this is going to sound nuts even saying out loud when i do data exfil you often have to provide your dropbox link you have to provide yeah. your discord webhook you have to provide whatever it is but the thing is is at the end of the day you are providing something that you yourself own you yep. yourself has control over what i'm about to show you is data exfil over public dns i'll try to reword that just in case you didn't catch this is data exfil over other people's websites wow every single computer that ran that powershell module would get a unique reverse shell ran on their system that i would then have access to and full control over the truth is i've always been kind of afraid to tell people like where the passion came from but what was the event that caused you to make this a a lifelong passion that you're going to put all your energy into do you know the difference between mean and median do you know what simpson's paradox is what about absolute deviation variance and standard deviation brilliant has a course that can teach you what all of these mean and much, much more in their Fundamentals of Statistics course. They also have more advanced courses teaching topics like linear regression, hypothesis testing, and sampling. There are many, many courses available on Brilliant, a whole array of courses teaching LLM, statistics, data analysis, and many, many more topics. What's great about Brilliant is they make statistics not just understandable, but genuinely engaging, rather than just watching someone talking, which puts you to sleep. You're actively engaged in your learning by using interactive lessons. Again, you're not just listening, you're actually doing. You're gonna be creating graphs, exploring probability, and understanding data like never before. Each course takes you on a journey from basic concepts to complex analysis. You'll learn to craft scatter plots, bar charts and get to grips with statistical techniques used in real scientific research. What's also great about Brilliant is they don't shy away from the tricky parts. You'll explore different sampling methods, uncover potential biases, and understand what truly makes data reliable. These courses are designed to be intuitive and engaging. They equip you to read scientific literature critically and understand the world through the lens of data. With Brilliant, statistics become an accessible, essential skill. I really want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. Without companies like Brilliant supporting me, I wouldn't be able to create as much free content as I can. So big thanks to Brilliant for not only creating amazing courses, but also for supporting my channel. So join the statistics revolution with Brilliant. Start with any of their comprehensive courses today. You can visit brilliant.org forward slash David Bumble for a special offer available for the first 200 signups. Let's conquer statistics together with Brilliant. Everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very, very special guest. Jacoby, welcome. Um, how you doing, David? I really, really appreciate you for having me on. Choose your hacker. I am Jacoby. Demo part one, PowerShell Gallery. All right, so here we are. We're looking at the PowerShell Gallery, right? So this is the web, the web version of it. Um, most people access the PowerShell Gallery, obviously, through the PowerShell console. Some of them don't even know that this uh, website even exists. Um, well, what is this? Just for, for everyone who's not, who hasn't seen it or don't know what it, don't know what it is. Correct. So the PowerShell gallery is a centralized repository for people to share their code, share their scripts, share their modules um, with the rest of the community. You know, it's it's really nice to have and a lot of good things have come from it. But being, you know, PowerShell focused like I am, um, this is something I took a deep dive into. Okay. And there are definitely some things that you can do that you should not be able to do. And uh, I definitely have reported these to Microsoft. Um, yeah, so you can go through here and like I'll type in C2. Essentially, what I was doing once upon a time is you have these descriptions for these PowerShell modules. Now, these descriptions for the PowerShell modules are easy to be queried from the PowerShell console. And you could put whatever data structure that you want inside of them. So if I were to open up the PowerShell window right now, and we were to look up that C2 module, we would literally just use our uh, demo C2 uh, description, sorry. And you'll see that it will return the description fields for any of the modules you're looking up. That's, uh, that's a pretty standard, uh, a pretty standardized feature. If you're looking here, you're gonna see that my description kind of doesn't look like the rest of the descriptions in here. And this is kind of a journey that we went on to get to this point. 
essentially what I used to do is I would just put straight PowerShell code into the description of these modules. Now with modules, there are certain safeguards in place to try to prevent the code from inside of them being run on systems without some sort of check. So for example, in order to use install module to pull one of these down, you have to have the NuGet package um, on your system to give you access to this gallery. So you can't just upload code on here that would be quote unquote trusted without having some sort of gate to prevent it from instant execution. The thing is, is since you can query these, you can just take it and then instantly pipe it into IEX and it'll run the code that is in the description field. Now, in this instance, it won't run it right away because this is indeed base 64. So that was the original bounty that I turned in uh, starting out. It ended up growing over time to be uh, more exploitable. And to be honest, I don't want to share everything on here. I am still trying to work with Microsoft and get them to fix a few things. And I'm not trying to, some of it's a little bit too much. I'm not trying to put weapons directly into people's hands. Yeah. After I was reporting this once upon a time, uh, I I'd actually got a contact from Microsoft, reported it directly to that contact. And then two weeks later, there was an attempted patch that they put out. So what they ended up doing is they, they put the description of PowerShell modules into PowerShell constrained language mode. It means there's only seven variables that you're allowed to use that are already predefined by the system henceforth breaking it so you can't put code into there and execute it, it won't work. So one of the first workarounds you would think to do is, well, I'll just convert it to base64 first because if it's in base64, there are no visible variables. I can still keep code in there. I just need to convert it from base64 and execute it. So I was sitting there, you know, almost laughing at them. Like, I can't believe you guys just, that's all you're going to do. So I ended up trying to do that and uh, converting it from base64 or converting it to base64 in the description, pulling it down, converting it back, and then executing it. And it actually wasn't working. We ended up doing a little bit of digging and did some research. And it turns out that at the end of all of these modules, you can't actually see it, but there is a hidden uh, Punjabi character at the end of this, right here, right past that equal sign. You can't see it, but they put it there so it breaks the code. So when you pull it down, it doesn't execute properly. Now, the reason that companies like this should really try to reach out to the people who found the vulnerabilities is because it only took us about 30 seconds to make a workaround for their new yeah. fix. And this and is Microsoft. That yep. is literally done. Yeah, that's literally done with nothing more than a regex statement. So I'll show you an example. So this is the workaround that we had for them putting the hidden Punjabi character at the end of the description module. So you'll see C2 right here. That's the module that we're looking at. They put that little Punjabi character at the end. All you have to do is do replace and this little regex statement and it'll wipe any characters from it that are not supposed to be in and then just execute it like normally. So it, it was a an immediate easy fix, an immediate easy fix. Uh, so, you know, again, that's one of the reasons that when these, you know, when these companies, when we reach out to you and we, you know, we tell you, Hey, this is an issue we found, you should really consult us. And I was going to say, it's a problem because people like you, who are the ethical hackers need to, the company should talk to you because you discover this stuff. If you don't fix it or don't engage with the cybersecurity community, then the black hat hackers are going to break in. Has this got anything to do with this hack that happened recently at Microsoft? Oh, see, look, someone's connecting the dots. I did look into that one with a friend of mine um, named James, and we did come to the conclusion that we think that Microsoft actually played them. I can't confirm it, but I think that hack that took place might have actually been a Microsoft honeypot. I think they might have actually done well on that one, on that one specifically. Now, the problem is, is that the way that they described the attack, they didn't even want to say that they were hacked because someone got access to a legacy, you know, yeah. a, a legacy account and did yeah. escalation from there. And they said it was through brute force and password spraying as well. But the problem is, is that companies like these, they ignore certain vectors of attacks because they don't fall in the current guidelines for the bounties that they award. 
So they just yeah. sort of don't take them seriously. But the thing that's crazy about this, and I'm about to show you this now. So C2, I am Jacoby. This is me. We're going to look at some of the other modules that I've done. The thing is, is I actually also, I own the module called PowerShell. I own the module called PowerShell. Now, that alone shouldn't happen. No, that's crazy. I had to make some adjustments because I was doing some testing later. So this is my own information. But on top of that, on top of owning the PowerShell module from the PowerShell gallery, which is already trusted, if we go back to the previous version right here, you can see that the author is Microsoft and the copyright is Microsoft. You go to package details and it says it's owned by I am Jacoby and it's owned by the Microsoft Corporation. I can kick myself off of here and it'll say it's only owned by the Microsoft Corporation. And this is trusted by so many different companies out there and it gets even worse. So I wrote a script because once I realized that if you look right here, it shows that we have 5,539 downloads. People are actively downloading this. So I had to start looking into it. And as it turns out, there are a significant number of modules in the gallery that are being auto installed on systems and being run. Now, the thing is, is whenever you make a module, you have to install the module, then you have to import the module. And then you have to run something inside of it. But it's the only way that we've socially conditioned ourselves to use these modules. But the thing is, is the only reason when you run import module, the only reason it doesn't run any code is because people don't normally put the line to execute the code at the bottom of their modules, but there's nothing stopping you from doing it. So normally a module is just a function. It's not calling the function. You just import the function, then you use it yourself. Well, if you call the function at the bottom of your module, it will run when the module is just imported. So we did testing with that. And again, thousands and thousands of people are downloading this module called PowerShell. I'm not going to go through the list of all mine, but I can say that I own PowerShell Core as well. I own Discord. I own Twitter. I own Facebook. I own a plethora of modules that have been getting installed onto computers and just run with no, no checks. Now, again, Microsoft can say that's not our problem. It's not our responsibility to control who's downloading and using these. But the thing is, is there are at base level, there are certain module names that should not be able to be taken that you guys should own. You need to take PowerShell from me. You need to take PowerShell core from me. You need to make it so I can't spoof the author. You need to make it so I can't spoof the copyright. And you definitely need to make it so the package details doesn't say that Microsoft owns this because that level of trust is the same type of thing that was taken advantage of for the current Microsoft hack that you were saying, assuming that it wasn't a honeypot, like I'm trying to give them credit. Uh, it's that natural low level trust that can very easily be manipulated once you have a foothold. And they just don't seem to take those kinds of threats seriously. This is an official Microsoft thing, right? This uh, gallery, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And even honestly, just having the website itself is a vulnerability because you can go to the file list and you can see the files here. And if you go to them, you can see the code. So in here, I just put you know a fake function that just opens the calculator. But yeah. since this is actually here on a web page, if you go to inspect the source, you can actually pull this code directly from the page. So you can use invoke web requests on powershellgallery.com, this right here, and then regex through the page source, grab the code and execute it with, again, without any of the restrictions that the PowerShell Gallery is supposed to have, like with the NuGet package, the mini UAC prompt for, it's not real UAC, but like the confirmation to download the module. And, you know, you have PSAES. This is Michael Gadja. This Michael Gadja guy, he is probably the most popular contributor to the PowerShell gallery. You know, if you look at these, PS Windows update, he's responsible for 513 million downloads, you know? Well, he's got uh, PSAES, like I was just showing you, which is a module that you use to encrypt files, encrypt strings, you know, using AES. Well, since he has 
the file list here, since he has them right here, like protect AES message, this is the code right here to use AES encryption. And I can pull this on any system that I get access to. I can pull this directly from this site and use it on a target computer, looking like it's coming from a trusted source, coming from Michael Gaja himself. And with slight, slight alterations, this is essentially ransomware right here. This is essentially <laughs> ransomware. Wow. And it's just native on all systems. And again, this is just using modules that are already there. Anybody is allowed to publish to the PowerShell gallery without any verification at all, none. So this is just taking advantage of, you know, preloaded modules that are on here, not counting the fact that you can make your own, do whatever you want, and then have instant access through this URL. And it's, it's trusted on like most corporate systems that use the PowerShell gallery to any capacity. I mean, the stuff I've seen from you is like a lot, you've, you use PowerShell a lot and Discord to, to get data out of systems, right? But this is like something even more scary than like doing a rubber ducky or something. Um, did, I, did I understand that right? Yeah, yeah. It, just because it's, you know, it's instantly loaded. You know, I, yeah. a lot of my payloads even, I'm often just pulling code like this from my own GitHub, from, yeah. you know, whatever source you want to host it at. But those are, you know, a lot of times those are blocked or people that yeah. do a heuristic based behavior detection, you know, won't allow you to use, you know, invoke web request and, you know, Dropbox or, you know, invoke web request and Discord or GitHub or whatever it is. But it's not often that they'll try to block access to the PowerShell gallery. So it's, you know, it's just free. So you've raised this with Microsoft as well, right? Yeah. So I've. I've actually had the bounty denied a total of five times now. So they are definitely aware. And like I said, they have been making changes. They did change it again, like I said. So the description itself is in uh, restricted language mode, unless your module was made before they made that change and then you're grandfathered in. So all those modules that I grabbed, I can still put code in the description like nothing and run it with no problem. They're essentially grandfathered in. Wow. So, I mean, what do we do to resolve this? It's like, just make noise that Microsoft hears, right? And they need to do something about it. So I, I have, I have sent them, you know, I have sent them some suggested fixes the same way that I found out that there are a bunch of systems that are downloading my PowerShell. I'll go ahead and give you this one, Microsoft, if you're paying attention, I literally wrote a simple script that I pulled every single module out of the PowerShell gallery, which by the way is about 10,600 of them. They list their dependencies in the module. So I wrote a script that pulled every single module down. And then I looked at the dependencies for every single module. I took those dependencies and then I just checked to see if that module existed or if it was a blank dependency. And I now have a very long list of modules that call to other modules that don't exist yet. And I took them. I own them now. I own those modules that don't exist. So if I were to put malicious code into those modules that don't exist, all of those other modules would then download my module, my malicious module, and execute that code the same way that people have been doing with the PowerShell module itself. Even something as simple as that, you need to do better monitoring of your gallery. Like that was really easy for me to find those. And again, it would be hard to implement fixes on those per se. I can't pretend like I have a perfect fix for you. Um, I know that I've tried to engage in conversation with you. That way, maybe there could be some back and forth that would result in you know, better security for you. But to be honest, there only seems to be one person I've talked to so far from Microsoft that would be willing to have that kind of conversation with me, but I don't know if they necessarily have the pull to do anything with it. So you've, you've engaged with a bug bounty program, right? Correct. Yeah. That, that was the initial, that was the initial way that I turned it in. And then I turned in another, my, my, the second time I turned it in was through there as well. And then I decided I, I left it alone for like eight months. And then I found some new stuff that I'm not going to talk about on here. I, I, I just, I can't, it's not right. Yeah. No, um, it's too dangerous. I yeah. found some new stuff and I was like, I was like, wow, I really need to escalate this. So I actually got a contact on someone through Twitter and reached out to them directly. When I submitted all of that, I, and this actually broke my heart. I'm not going to lie. So when I submitted all of that, they didn't talk to me again ever. But two weeks later is when those fixes went in, you know, the PowerShell strand language 
putting the hidden Punjabi character at the end of the thing. And so it was heartbreaking to miss out on the bounty because it was a lot of money because even yeah. though it seems small and money. dumb, yeah. but that's, yeah, it seems small and dumb. But when you think about how like most, most hacking um, attacks that take place nowadays, they almost always start with phishing. You know what I yeah. mean? So we're talking about low level, dumb, it's always the low level dumb stuff. So it's just weird that you don't take it seriously. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely hurt to miss out on that bounty. But on top of that, there's something I can't necessarily prove, right? But like, we all know that the work that I do is very niche. It's very specific. Like them putting that hidden character at the end of the description, like that's very obvious that that was based off my work. Unfortunately, Microsoft, you made me really mad when you decided to not only give me my bounty, but then you, I know you went through my GitHub and you made a bunch of changes based off of my work. And you actually know that as well. We had an interview set up for a couple months ago and they released patch notes. I was on the computer at 1138, making sure my stuff still worked for you. And it wasn't anymore. At midnight that night, they released patch notes that fixed a bunch of the exploits that I was using. And that led me to actually having to close down a, my very first workshop that I was ever gonna do. I was doing it on October 8th on my birthday. I was so excited. I had a bunch of people sign up for the class and they did so much damage to my work that I had to cancel the workshop and refund like seven grand, which is an insane amount of money for someone like me. Yeah. Um, and that's because they yeah, patched yeah, it right. That makes, yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because that, well, it's heartbreaking and it's bad for you because I don't necessarily feel the same. I don't feel as compelled to turn stuff into you anymore. And I feel like other people would probably feel similar. This is a problem. In the, in, but, it is a problem. Know. A lot of people have this issue, right? Because they submit stuff to companies, they get ignored or they get sued. Companies yeah. need to do better and engage with a community of ethical hackers to you know, secure their systems. Correct. And um, so I want to show you a, a project that I started working on a couple months ago that has landed me some really amazing opportunities recently. And then when you see how something like this can be plugged into this PowerShell gallery exploit, the same way I can put any code into any of these. Demo part two, polymorphic reverse shell generator. All right, so this is just Termius. This is just an SSH client. We're just going into a Linode server that I have. Um, so yeah, so this is a uh, this is an app called Termius. This is essentially just a SSH tool that I use to get into my Linode servers. Um, and this is a project shell sync that uh, we've been working on for a while. And um, one of the cool things that uh, we've built in here, we've kind of built a lot of tools. I built a little minimizer that, you know, it automatically minimizes your PowerShell scripts. You can put in any PowerShell script. It'll shorten it down to the, you know, the shortest amount of variables and uh, commandlets, aliases, everything. Just minimize as much as possible. But the coolest thing that we've built so far together is uh, a polymorphic reverse shell generator. Cool. So um, reverse shells, uh, I'm sure a lot of you do know, but if you don't, a reverse shell is what us hackers use on a target's computer to get their computer to reach out to ours. That way we have control over their computer. Yep. Now, the thing with reverse shells is that you know, any of the reverse shells that you'll find out there, they're so popular and common that they're basically instantly detected unless you're doing, you know, high level obfuscation and you got to do that by hand. It takes a while and it, it can be frustrating. So when you say we, that's you and a, you, you and a group of hackers, is that, is that correct? I, I have been fortunate enough that there have been a handful of different hackers that have crossed my paths that have helped contribute yeah. to the you know, contribute to the knowledge that I do have. All right, so we're just going to put on a basic Netcat listener right okay. here. This is our, it's just going to actually, you know what, even better. I forgot that we made this. Um, let's go ahead and go to our start listener. I forgot it looks a little better. The shell sync, our, our, our C2 hub. Uh, we're we'll just be listening on port 80. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and put together an API that I use to call to, I feed it the information of the target computer uh, and the computer that it wants to call out to. And what that is going to do 
is okay. So this is where we got right here. So we're going to use invoke rest method. Uh, we're going to call. Oh, it's going to make that bigger too. We're going to use invoke rest method. We're going to call out to our shell sync website, our a our our API. We're going to go to our reverse shell endpoint. We're going to plug in our target computer as an view we want to call out to what port, and then we want to encoding right now. And then just our uh, our API key. Every time that I run this, what it's going to do is going to make a call up to our API. It's going to grab our our template reverse shell that we have, and we have a couple of them that we rotate through. It's going to pull it down, and it's going to obfuscate it, as you see right here. Yeah. Now every single time that we run this, it's going to generate a brand new obfuscated version of that reverse shell every single time that it's ran. This reverse shell has never been ran on a computer before. So wow. there is not much for detection that you can do to stop it. So again, since it's just like my regular payloads that you guys have seen in the past, we do invoke REST method, we go to the site, we pull it down, and we pipe it into IEX. And just like that, we have, you know, we have a reverse shell. I just realized something funny. Uh, you can you can overwrite functions on your computer if you didn't know, like regular functions, like the who am I function yeah. that is supposed to say what your name is. I changed it. So every time you run who am I, it just replies with I'm the ghost in the machine just to piss <laughs> off any quote unquote hackers that would get into my system. If they run who am I on my machine, it'll say I am the ghost in the machine. So, <laughs> you know, that is my desktop right there. You know, we'll run calculator. I'm sure it's going to open on the other screen. I now have full control over my computer from, you know, our shell sync C2. Now, keeping in mind that 5,200 people have downloaded and ran my PowerShell, my quote unquote malicious PowerShell module from the gallery. All it would take is plugging this single line right here instead of that start calc function that I had in that one yeah. example. If this was inside of there. Every single computer that ran that PowerShell module would get a unique reverse shell ran on their system that I would then have access to in full control over. And when I try to tell you how effective this is, it's honestly hard to even do. But this is the best that I can tell you. I have friends that are so kind and they have access to systems where we can do some really awesome testing, AKA I had someone that have access to Sentinel-1, Elastic, and CrowdStrike. Uh, if you guys don't know, those are basically the top three antiviruses that the government uses, that the government uses. We have a one, not 99.9, .9, we have a 100% success rate shelling any computer that we've tried. Wow. Now you can go as far now, if you wanted to be, you know, if you wanted to go far enough and quote unquote, disable PowerShell, right? Sure. Congratulations. You could potentially thwart us and knock our, knock us a percent down, but nobody's like completely fully disabling PowerShell. It's just not typically a thing. I think that the closest that somebody has, is going to be to possibly beating us, uh, there is a company called Threat Locker that does heuristic based behavioral detection. So they'll be looking to see if PowerShell is being ran with certain apps that have been decided are not normal for the current user yeah. and then we'll disable it. So that's probably the most creative approach we've seen to try and stop this. Uh, we have not got to officially work with them yet to do testing on it. I am really curious, but outside of that, this polymorphic reverse shell can be put, I guess I'd write into those galleries and uh, we, we would have access to every single one of those computers that, that ran it. That's crazy. Yeah, because the question I was going to ask you, and you've kind of answered it, is that how does that command get run? I mean, the way that you've always traditionally done it in the demos that I've seen or, or on your code is like using an OMG cable or using a, a rubber ducky or something, but this is like an even another, even more scary way using that gallery. Correct. So between using the gallery... Um, I'll pull this over. Okay, so when you're talking about uh, methods for execution, these are uh, some of the more advanced methods. Like right now, what you've seen me run 
was just basically this command right here. And that is just the basic execution of it. Yeah. And again, this is all we needed to beat every every government antivirus that we've tried so far. But if you wanted to go further, we have an encoding option with it as well, where this one, for example, will first, uh, it'll take that polymorphic reverse shell, it'll reverse it and then convert it to base 64. So then this is a line to do the opposite and then run it. This is reverse yeah. hex execution, double reverse execution, which by the way, just reversing something twice beats a lot of um, antiviruses, not these top mm. ones, but it'll walk. Weirdly enough, you shouldn't just be able to reverse something twice and have it walk through Defender, but it actually does work. And of course, we had to make a version where we execute it straight from the PowerShell gallery. So this is grabbing it straight from the description field and then replacing the Punjabi character that they put at the end to quote, unquote, thwart us. My favorite by far is DNS X record execution. So I've made a video on this. If you guys didn't know, you can store payloads in DNS text records on your website. Yeah. And then you can query those DNS text records, just pipe them right into execution. So we have shell sync that what the fuck is our website. And uh, RS is our reverse shell. Sure, it pops up as a subdomain, but it is our text record called reverse shell. And it just has that reverse shell in it. And then you can pipe it. So even if like the PowerShell gallery was actually disabled, uh, DNS traffic is not something that's often monitored well enough to stop something like this. Uh, the scary thing is, okay, so now you've, now you've made us worry. Now, how do we solve this? Is it be that the antivirus vendors need, you need to engage with the antivirus vendors you need to disable PowerShell, you know, what can I do? Because I look at this and I think this is crazy. That is something that I am trying to work with people on to be able to put out a robust enough solution that it would be worthwhile on, I guess, on a mass scale, which again, I was kind of impressed with a threat locker because like their whole thing is saying that EDR is not enough, which is, that's kind of the point that I've been trying to make is that EDR is not enough. We can, we can walk around it. So just for example, how they do uh, behavior-based detection, that is something that's, you know, really big and should be looked into. I'm not saying that it can be the perfect solution or it will be, but what I can say for sure is that what's being done right now is not enough. And in order to fix problems outside of the box, you have to think outside the box. And I think uh -huh. that that's just an area where they're lacking. But you know, you have, you have programmers at Microsoft that are trying to prevent these things, but uh, the hacker mentality, the hacker mindset is just something different. You just look at every individual thing and say, how can I break this? How can I turn this? How can I? And I feel like sometimes the people that are trying to defend against these kind of things, they just, they just don't have the same mindset. They're not in the same place mentally to be able to identify threats like this, or sometimes even see them when you spell it out to them. So again, we have a pretty good introduction through the PowerShell gallery. We have full control over their system when they do execute this onto their system. And then on top of that, um, there's a, another project that I really want to show you. And we're going to load into this guy right here. Just while we're waiting, I mean, for me, the big lesson here is the, the, the biggest mistake companies are making is they're ignoring the ethical hacking community and they need to engage better because guys like you are finding the stuff. That is correct. So here we are. We have now uh, exploited the PowerShell gallery. We now have a polymorphic reverse shell that we've placed inside of that gallery that is giving us full access to these people's systems. Great, so now we're on their system. We're finding the information that we want. We're finding the information uh, that we need to gather and we want to exfil it. Demo part three, exfiltration, data bouncing. Now it's our goal to get this information back to us in the most undetected way possible. and. In this instance, we are going to be using a technique called data bouncing. Shout out to the contractor and the pirate, uh, both out of the UK. Um, after seeing my polymorphic reverse shell video, they reached out to us and decided to share this project that they were working on. Uh, they built this original project. I went back and rebuilt it 
in PowerShell and just try to optimize it a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up for you real quick. So this is a, well, actually, this isn't even private right now. I did indeed make this public. Uh, so you guys can go check this out if you like. This is a technique called data bouncing. One thing that I've gotten kind of pretty well known for are my data exfil techniques, uh, whether doing it through Dropbox, Discord, uh, through DNS, through whatever it is. I love data exfil. The idea of just stealthily disappearing with, with data is, it's just something that personally me is just so very exciting. So when they showed me this technique and they brought us on, it just absolutely blew my mind. And I, I, I want to make sure that I'm not trying to exaggerate when I say this, when they showed this to me, I laid awake for nights, like for like, I want to say weeks after I'd be laying in bed, just in my head, trying to conceptualize a method that would be better for exfilling data. And I couldn't even make something up in my head. The only thing I think that could possibly beat this is if you exfil data onto a USB drive and we also figured out teleportation. So you teleport that USB drive back to your house through actual teleportation. That is literally the only thing I could come up with that would be a better data exfil method than this. So we're going to go down. If you guys want, you guys can come through here. You can check this out. Uh, again, these are, this is the original team. You can go to contractor.io forward slash data hack bouncing. And they have it all laid out here, how it works. This is the same thing that I went through and then just made a PowerShell version. Now, what this data exfil is, and this is going to sound nuts even saying out loud, when I do data exfil, you often have to provide your Dropbox link. You have to provide yeah. your Discord webhook. You have to provide whatever it is. But the thing is, is at the end of the day, you are providing something that you yourself own. You yep. yourself has control over. What I'm about to show you is data exfil over public DNS. I'll try to reword that just in case you didn't catch. This is data exfil over other people's websites. Wow. And so you might ask yourself, well, what websites are vulnerable? Which ones can I use? How do you find out which ones? Well, fortunately, they made this really nifty video for you just to help you with that. This video is going to help give you an idea of what websites you can use for this data exfil method. Let's go ahead and check it out. Keep in mind, this video is 10 minutes and 56 seconds long. Those websites, oh, wow. those are the websites you can use. And this will continue for the next 10 minutes and 56 seconds. Or I can make it really easy. And I can tell you that it's any website that uses Akamai, AKA about 88% of the internet. So we'll go back to here. I decided uh, they did this really cool theme with theirs where they call like their, they call their files like the watcher, the receiver, the escapist. And I thought that was really cool. So I kind of wanted to follow that pattern. So I decided to use X-Men. So we have two files, one called Nightcrawler and one called Deadpool. Nightcrawler is going to take that information and poof, bring it wherever you want it. Deadpool it's going to take that big explosive brought in information, regenerate it and bring it back together. So uh, you can come through here. I did make a little GUI. So if you were to open PowerShell, this really couldn't be easier to use. You can do info rest method with a unit 259 uh, DB and then just GUI, DB GUI, pipe it into IEX and it will open up this little box right here. And this is all you need. You can, anybody can use this. You run that one little line on your target computer. Now this is a GUI, so you're not necessarily always gonna do this like, you know, in a real situation, you're not gonna pull a GUI out, but I just wanted to make it as easy to use so you could watch it and illustrate it. We are actually ourselves, we're not gonna use the GUI. I just wanna show you that it is an option. You can check it out after I show you the CLI version. If you wanna use the easier one, you can absolutely do that. So we're gonna, Go ahead and put these back over here real quick so I can have access back to here. All right, so starting off, we're in DB. We're going to need a, another one. So let's duplicate that one. And then inside here, we're going to do inter, interact sh client r. Make sure we're in the right ls. Uh, XTG data balancing. Make sure we're in there. CLS. Um, we're going to do clear log. Make sure they're clear real quick. And then we're going to start our interact sh server. 
If you guys aren't familiar with this, uh, Interact SH is a OOB out of bounds listener, and uh, you use it to capture DNS traffic. All right, so this uh, URL right here is what's going to be important. Then over here inside of this one, we want to. Yes, I download PowerShell Core on Linux. I use PowerShell even on Linux. So nice. yeah, yeah, uh, we do everything in PowerShell over here. Yeah, we do everything in PowerShell. All right, so we're going to be sitting in here. Now we want to go into, so we have that logs, that text right there. So we're going to go ahead and go in there. You're going to see that it's empty. Perfect. All right. So now once we're in here, we have this URL. Now, conceptually, this was kind of hard for me to grasp at first, but it, it's such a genius technique. So the first thing that we want to do is we're going to load up. We're not going to load up the GUI. So if you don't want the GUI, you just use just DB. That's to get the command line interface in. So now once we have that, let it run. Boom. All right. So now we have access to the function, to the nightcrawler function that's going to be called vanish, right? And sure, I got to go to the desktop, the VB desktop, CLS, pull it in. Sorry, we have to do that from the desktop. Uh, I have a file on my desktop that's just called AST test dot text. Right. So again, this will get a smidge bit confusing, but I promise you, I can help you guys walk right through this. What we want to do is we want to grab this URL right here and then we're going to plug it in here. So this is where things can get uh, potentially complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this. This is the line that we're going to run. Now you guys saw earlier that I was using resolve DNS name, right? So I have a DNS text record called RS right here. You can use resolve DS name on URLs and pull information from them. Now, something that not a lot of people know is that when you use resolve DNS name on a website, that website will let you know that resolve DNS was used on it by someone else. And you can capture that using this out of bounds listener that you see above. So again, if I run this, this is going to grab our reverse shell that we had in there. This is the DNS text record. Okay. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be abusing all those websites that you just saw. I've been using adobe.com as the example, just because that's one of the first ones I grabbed and it works. So that's what we will be using today. So if you do invoke web requests, right? Uh, and we'll do adobe.com and grab the headers. This is going to give you the headers for adobe.com, right? Now, something that you need to know about these headers is that you can modify them when you're doing invoke web requests. You can modify these headers. A lot of bug bounty people that do web apps will know this. This is how you can... Uh, take advantage of a lot of different attack vectors out there. A behavior that not a lot of people are aware of is that if there is a URL inside of certain headers that you see right here, if there is a URL inside of them, AKA you put your own header and you make it a URL, the website that you are doing invoke web request to, that being adobe.com in this instance, Adobe.com will run Resolve DNS on your URL. Their website will run Resolve DNS on your URL. We're going to take advantage of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug our own URL in there and force them to run Resolve DNS on our website. So that's this right here. This is our website that links to our out of bounds listener. Now, if we come back into here and we run that line that I was telling you about, we're going to run vanish on this file going through adobe.com and then providing our out of bounds listener right here. So now if you go to our second instance, this is just showing what's inside of our folder. Like these are the logs, the logs are empty, right? So when we go back to here, we're going to run this. And it's going to look like it errors out. Now, we'll come back to what Alita is. Alita is an overarching identifier. We'll just call it the ID for this file. We'll call it the ID for this file. You can name it whatever you want. 
We'll get back to that in a second. We're going to run this. It's going to look like it's airing out a little bit. Boom. But if we come over here, you see how it's spitting this out. Look, host adobe.com.alita. And then it's got this little, this string of characters. We're going to go ahead and let this run through till it finishes. This is a quick file. Uh, should not take long at all. All right, so it's done. This is done. So now what you need to understand is, is we have a file called AST on our desktop that I was just telling you about, right? That file, what we did is we took that file, we took the contents of the file, we first converted the contents of the file to base64, right? And then we converted it to hex. We took that data and we converted the contents of it from base64 and then into hex. And then we take in that one long hex string and it's being split up into chunks between eight and 12 characters long. So we're separating that data into a bunch of different chunks. Now we want to send all those individual chunks over to us where we will reconstruct them. Now, in order to make that happen, we had to get a little creative. You'll see this first line right here. So it says 4G465. G is just a separator. That's like a comma separated value. It's a G separated value. This four right here is actually saying how many segments total there are. This was a short message. There's only four segments, but we have encoded metadata into the string that is also containing the hex data. So this is the fourth chunk, and this is the hex data from that fourth chunk. It's a small bit right there. We're using Alita as the name of the container that stores all of those individual chunks. Now, if we come back to here and we do LS again, or I'm sorry, we'll do cat logs, you'll see that the logs are here on our server as well. The logs are actually here. So now essentially all we have to do is parse through this data right here. And that would be right up here. All right, make sure that I have it. Okay, yeah, so regenerate is there. Now we're going to regenerate it. And then we just want to name the container that we gave it. Because again, all those chunks are being sent all around. We name the container. Or, oops, one second. Apparently I didn't put it into the profile. So just load it individually. And now we'll do a regenerate. Sorry about that. Perfect. And if we do ls, if we did it properly, there should be a file called alita.txt. So now we do cat on alita.txt. And I think I, oh yeah, I just made it say it fucking worked, dude. Because I was excited. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. That's the, that's the little message. Flawless victory. So we took that file that's on my desktop, which is let's see where is it over here so this is ast.txt right here this is that text file go ahead and open it up and again it's just a text file that says it fucking worked dude but to be clear you can do this with whatever you want you can do this with images with executables now keep in mind you're converting the whole thing to hex and then splitting it up in chunks and sending those individually so it will take a unbelievably long time but if you're just trying to exfil, you know, a little bits of data, uh, a password, a key, uh, you know, whatever it is, this is a really efficient and unbelievably stealthy way to do it. So if we were to, I, I probably should have did this actually, if I would have had Wireshark open while we did this and we were looking at the requests, it would show that this came from adobe.com. It does not show our site. It does not show any trace of it at all. It comes straight from adobe.com, which if the gears are turning in your head right now, you know that that opens up so many other vulnerabilities because we can do DNS cache poisoning. And I don't want to say too much because some of this where you are still trying to turn in for a bounty. Like I said, this works on basically all systems that are running Akamai. And then on top of that, we identified a certain configuration on certain systems that are running Akamai that not only allow you to use them to exfil data, but when you're passing that data through them, you can put that file on their system. Wow. Whatever happens to that file when it's over there, that's completely based off of their rules. Like, what do they do? 
The same way we found out that they use Resolve DNS name on URLs that are in the headers, what else is happening? What else do they do? If a PHP file comes through, are they going to run it? You know what I mean? You don't know. The yeah. point is, is that the possibilities are like right now, we, we've been trying to do a lot of testing, but obviously you have to ins- have an insane amount of environments that you can test in to be able to do this efficiently. So actually this is the next video that I'm putting out on my channel is on data bouncing. And our goal is to get the community involved in this. That way we can try to find out what those other vulnerabilities are or what projects you can make. Like we made a, uh, we actually made a texting app that uses this. We can text each other in PowerShell using somebody else's website and just send messages back and forth. And it's, it's, it's really cool because, you know, you have the dark net, you have the clear net, and all of a sudden we think we found like fucking Harry Potter, Diagon Alley. We found Diagon, you know, there's this place right in the middle that is no man's land. I don't know. It's just, it's really exciting. It's, it's, it feels like, you know, new space, new, new territory. And, uh, that, that's insane, dude. Wow. Yeah. So again, cycling through all of this, all it takes is some small dumb mistake, like Microsoft not fixing the PowerShell gallery. And now all of a sudden I have 5,000 downloads. That's just that one module to be clear. Remember that was just a yeah. PowerShell module. I am quote unquote typo squatting or sitting on so many different PowerShell modules that are getting thousands of downloads just by default every single day, every single day. So between those downloading those, putting the polymorphic reverse shell into those full control, and then basically an invisible data exfiltration that it it can't be traced. Like it just, you're going through public DNS. It's just, we kind of went full circle. You gotta, you gotta let us know at some point where if you get, if you get a bounty for this, cause I mean, this is crazy. Um, we are trying and to be honest, I, you know, we hope that other people start trying, you know, they already made this public, that website's public. My repository is public. If you guys want to go through, find out what you can do with this and see the vulnerabilities. Because again, like I told you, we did find some systems that we can put a file on it and we have narrowed it down to thinking that this is a bad default configuration. That's what we think it is not confirmed, but you got to think that if we did find a consistent way to get files onto certain computers, that means that's technically you could apply for an RCE bounty on every website that it touches. You know what I mean? Every company or every website that it touches. So there is potential for a lot of bounties to be made. So yeah, we just wanted to get this in front of the community and hope that you know, everybody can come together and do some, you know, probably some crazy shit with it. So the best way to get hold of you is a Twitter, is a Twitter or X as it's called these days. What's the best way to get hold of you? So, you know, people are interested in this? 100% Twitter, 100% Twitter. But if you wanted to look me up on basically any social media, I am just, I am Jacoby on all social media. Sometimes there's like a underscore on some of them or whatever, but you type, I am Jacoby on any social media, you should be able to find me. And uh, if you want to, if you want to reach out, if you want to contribute, if you want to work on this, if you know, you have any ideas and listen, no ideas are dumb. You need to understand that this started by just putting a URL in a header, which just seems, I don't want to say it seems dumb, but anything can seem dumb or small until it works. So if you have anything that you want to contribute, feel free, reach out. Hey, dude, it's fantastic to have you here. Eventually, I, we've been talking about this for a long time. Just for people who don't know you, I'll just mention this. You are the payload winner in 2022 for Hack5, but I'm going to do a really bad job introducing that. So you got to tell me, what does that actually mean? What have you been doing? You know, all these awards that you win, dude, you do amazing stuff. So tell us a bit. I appreciate you. Yes. Yeah, so the Hack 5 Payload Awards is something that took place last year. Um, it was the first year where they wanted to recognize people from the community who were contributing to them and, uh, you know, creating different works that people could learn from and take apart and build their own work off of. I, I honestly, I've been building payloads for Hack 5 for almost 10 years. I just personally, I didn't have the confidence to go out and show it. You know, I was looking at everybody else that was in the scene and, you know, just thinking about how talented they were and didn't allow myself to try to measure up to them. I, it just, uh, probably about two years ago, I reached out to the Hack5 Discord 
I asked a couple questions and just realized how nice the community was, how much they wanted to help the people that came into the community. And I was like, you know what, maybe I will start trying to share some of my work. So I shared some of it and they were pretty impressed with it. So I was like, okay, I'll submit it. I'll submit it. And you know, I submitted my first payload. It got accepted. I got butterflies. Um, I submitted two more like within the week and they had also got accepted. And uh, at that point, you know, I was just feeling on top of the world. So I was like, you know what? I have this huge library that I've accrued over the last several years. I just updated them and just started rapidly submitting them. And I want to say probably within a month and a half, I was in first place on the leaderboard and then just held that position for the rest of the year. December came around and they did the awards and, you know, they handed out a bunch of awards. There was a lot of great people. You had Adam on the channel before Adam actually got third place as well. Not even in his area of specialty. He's just a talented kid. Peaks, he is another really talented kid. He, uh, he won basically all the iPhone hacking awards that there were. He's just wildly talented. And, uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, that I received enough votes to take the first place position ever since then, like. I've been accepted into the community on a whole nother level and uh, it's been amazing. I tell you what you said right there is so, I think it's so, so important for many people to hear and it's inspirational. You know, that the imposter syndrome thing is a big problem in, in the community. You had all this stuff and all this talent and it was hidden away. And when you shared it, you won like number one. What a story, man. That's fantastic. I started being open about it too, you know, cause people would ask me like, you know, how, did you just make all these recently? And I was yeah. like, no, I gotta be honest. I've been sitting on these for like eight years and uh, it's it's actually happy and sad at the same time when I think about this. I started to be really open with my community and talking about things like imposter syndrome. Yeah. And it was really cool because there's a lot of people that also go through it that were you know, finding the motivation to push past it. Yeah. And then something that was really cool for me is actually the creators that I looked up to that I eventually got the privilege to talk to and they shared their experience. And some of the people at the top of the food chain that you would never suspect, you know, they also, you know, it comes and goes. It's something that yeah. you can defeat for a while and then you might just have a bad week or something and it comes back. And there's so many people that struggle with it, even at the top. And it's sad, but also kind of motivating knowing that they still you know, beat it on regular occasions and I see them being successful and it's highly motivating for me. And then that's just transferring down to the people that I also get to talk to. I think it's so important. You know, we just people, all of us, all of us are individuals going on a journey and you just got to make the most of who you are and where you've come from. And I want you to share a little bit, if you don't mind about like your journey, because some of us have had much easier journeys than others. And your story particularly wasn't that easy. And that's putting it very like badly it, it was rough so can you tell us how you got into hacking when you were a kid and sort of you mentioned something offline about a spark and a fire maybe you can tell take us through that journey of how you went or how you came to where you are today you know winning these awards and stuff yeah uh, absolutely um so i came to that realization that there was a huge differential between a spark and a fire when i did a podcast with another uh, person that i really look up to that's also been on your show uh shout out to philip wiley um, yeah, I love you, by guy. the way. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. And uh, I was on there and he had, you know, started asking some of these similar questions and asked me how I got started. And the truth is, is I gave him the answer for how the spark was initially lit, like the thing that kind of piqued my interest at the beginning. The truth is, I've always been kind of afraid to tell people like where the passion came from be clear, there is a differential, you know, the spark is what got your initial interest, but what was the event that caused you to make this a, a lifelong passion that you're going to put all your energy into? Same for when I told him the spark came from literally me just being in fifth grade. And it, this was a wild scenario, right? This was a wild scenario. Yeah. I, my, I lost my dad when I was 11, um, to suicide and Sorry I about that, man. was put into a foster home and, uh, uh -huh. Fun fact, I actually found out when I got there that I went by the wrong name for 10 years. The people that I ended up getting adopted by were military. So I had to get a military ID that had a different last name on it than when I went by publicly to everybody. And I knew I was only going to be at this school I was in in fifth grade for the rest of that one year. And I decided to kind of wild out just a little bit. It was something small. I just, um, you know, just do the command prompt. I got the the school's uh, Wi-Fi password, which uh, shout out Nelson Ledges in Ohio. You guys had your Wi-Fi password as Eureka, all capital letters. <laughs> and then um, 
unknowingly, I started practicing something called password spray, where you just take that password and you plug it in everywhere that you can and just see if it works. And wildly enough, I had like a 90% success rate with everything that I tried. It turns out that password was almost universal. So you could get into the portal, look at your grades. So here we are in this little computer lab. We get this little break where we all get to go to the computers. And you know, I'm, I'm showing off for these kids and like, hey, here's look, this is the Wi-Fi password. This is how you can get into here. And at the same time, I was showing them my military ID that had a different last name on it from what I went by publicly. Wow. And again, I was only going to be at that school for the rest of that fifth grade year. So I decided, let's go for it. I told them all I was in the witness protection program, <laughs> that I was like hacking governments <laughs> and I had to be, you know, I had to be protected. I never, uh, I never actually even told them the truth. I just told them that blew their minds and then left that year and never talked to them again. Wow. So what's up guys? If you, you probably don't recognize me, but yeah, kind of, kind of lied about some of that stuff back then. Yeah, so that that was the thing that kind of sparked my interest. And that's what turned this into a hobby. And, you know, for years and years and years, I, that's that's really all I was doing. I was just learning it because it was fun. It was exciting. It was just something to do. Now, there was a certain point in my life where a switch kind of flipped, where it went from just being something I wanted to do for fun to being something now, as you see, is something I've dedicated basically my entire life to. And for me... That moment was when I was deployed to Iraq. To fully understand this, I remember being a kid and I'd be watching, be watching movies and such on TV. And, you know, whether it was like these movies about alien invasions or wars or whatever, I remember watching them and thinking how kept in the dark civilians were. Like always in yeah. these movies, civilians were just completely lost, you know? Yeah then the military would come in and they'd be telling people, hey, you need to go here, you need to do this. And that knowledge and structure is something that I, I really wanted to have. I didn't like the idea of being left in the dark like a lot of these people in these movies and such. So for me personally, that was one of the big reasons I joined the military is I thought that it would get me in the know. You know, being infantry as I was and not even an officer, like being enlisted, it's hard to be in the know period. Uh, you know, being infantry especially, and I realized that in the military, when you're deployed, we have something called the QRF. This is a quick response force. These are the guys that while we're over there, we put them on rotation and you stay in full uniform, full kit, gun ready. That way, if anything happens, they have somebody that they can immediately send out to the seat. I was on the QRF for this particular day. It, it was just, it was wild. It was, it was so surreal. Everything that happened over the next couple of days, we had to go show up to, I think it was the building there was an ip graduation this is the iraqi police there was a graduation you know all uh you know this huge class hundred plus people went through and passed um as it turns out two of those individuals that went through the entire academy uh were suicide bombers and oh, wow. their whole goal was just to be in the crowd during graduation and that's exactly what they did and they did detonate in the crowd there were people that lost their lives from that initial event that we had to respond to. And, um, um, it was a not great day. Um, yep. you know, that took place. They took some hostages and backed into this building and, uh, it was, it was just a lot. And so that event happened now and we end up finding ourselves like two days later, we're back on, um, I was at Cop Spiker at the time. We're in this huge chow hole and something if you guys didn't know, these military bases, they're not just for US soldiers. We had British guys, we had Australian guys. I think we even had the Philippine army there at one point. So in the chow hole, they have these TVs lining all of the walls. It'll either be football games or if something big happens, it'll all be the news. You know, I was, I was in Iraq when bin Laden was killed, for example, that was on every TV. Now I wasn't personally involved with that. So it didn't register the same way that this event did. The thing is, is this attack on the was broadcast internationally all over the world. So I'm watching, we have TVs of like the British news and the Australian news, the American news and news from all these different countries that were talking about this event that happened. But they were all saying different things. Like they were all oh, saying well. it was for a different reason or 
this is what happened there. This is what happened. And it was the first time that I felt at the center of this huge event where I could tell, maybe not necessarily who was lying per se, but who was changing the narrative and how they were changing and how information was being disseminated and passed down. Like that was the day that I realized that I would never, I would never make it out of like that darkness of not knowing like I thought I would. And uh, like, yeah, that was the day that I decided that cybersecurity was going to be the path that I took that uh, it was in my head at the time. I was saying, this is going to be the only way that I could for sure know that I'm going to get the knowledge that I can communicate with people who have access to the real knowledge or to the real scenario situations. And yeah, yeah. So from that day uh, is when I buckled down and you know, completely self-taught at first. Eventually, you know, Udemy came out and I started going for those courses and taking them. And I've taken uh, two of your Udemy courses, actually. Oh, thank you. Um, the networking. Yeah, the networking to get me caught up. When you're self-taught, it's really easy to only learn what you want to learn and what you yeah. need to learn in the moment. Yeah. There's a lot of corners that you forget or don't touch or, you know, we're weak on. Uh, after that day, like I, I got out uh, maybe a year after that. And then ever since then, I've done nothing but almost spend 18 hours a day. And that's almost without exaggeration, just building things, learning, taking courses, studying people. That's amazing. So, I mean, in school is where the spark was lit, right? Because you pretended to be this um, in the witness protection program and you were hacking the Wi Fi network, did a whole bunch of stuff at school. Uh, but it was that time in the military where the fire lit and you decided, this is it, I'm going to do cyber, right? Correct. Um, and actually, um, and we kind of talked about this off camera for a second, you know, I, when all that took place, I actually, it was more of a question, I guess, actually like, you know, is this what I should be doing? Is, is, is this, you know, is this the information sector that I should go to that I think is going to give me what I'm searching for? Yeah. And, you know, I got, I got out with that question in my head. Like I knew for sure that that's the path that I wanted to go down. But I think there's a certain point like where it really, really clicks, I guess. This is really wild. And I haven't actually told a lot of people this, but so when I was in the military, I actually got stationed in Hawaii. So I was stationed in Hawaii. And when we got back from Iraq, me and a couple of buddies, we ended up getting a house together in a place called Waipahu. It was absolutely beautiful. And uh, something absolutely crazy happened. This is still mind blowing to me. I'm sure most people on this channel probably know who Edward Snowden is. Yep. So he, you know, everything went down in April of 2013. It was just a couple months after that, that the whole Edward Snowden thing blew up and he was all over the news and it's crazy. But um, fun fact, uh, Edward Snowden was actually my neighbor live next door to me. Now I had no idea or anything, you know, I don't know. Like I, to be honest, like I was questioning myself. Uh, I was questioning the things that I saw while I was in the military. I was questioning the, the morality of the things that I saw. And I was questioning whether or not I should be doing something about it, or if I should be saying something or if, you know, something had to be done. And I don't know, just, again, I never, I, I, I'd never really even spoken to him. Like I'd seen him like wave, but that just felt like a message from the universe that, yo, you are on the right path. This actually is a big issue and it really does need to be addressed. And I think, I think you're finding your way. So when you talk about the very, very specific click, I was back home in Alabama where I graduated sitting on the couch when I saw everything with him come out. Yeah, it, it was it was wild. It was a lot to process, but I just remember sitting there and realizing that yes, 100% there needs to be people like him. There needs to be people willing to step up and say the right things. It was, it was a huge motivation and that that was the exact moment that I decided this is the route that I wanted to go. And I kept it to myself. And like I said, I, for years and years, I was just learning and doing solo personal projects, but it gets to a point when you realize that this isn't something that you can do alone no. and no one person, like there's as much as Edward Snowden did by himself, it's still the whole point of everything that he said is that it's an issue that even he can't tackle by himself. Okay. It took me years to make that realization even though I shouldn't have, but that specifically is what got me into content creation and 
This is why I put such an emphasis in my content being uh, being put out in a way that's easy to process for newer people coming into the cybersecurity field that want to get started. I, I, I want as many people in the cybersecurity field as absolutely possible. That's been that's been the motivation for the for the channel. We need it, right? Because the, I mean, there's so many hacks taking place. We need people like you to um, you know find the problems and um, help companies protect them. Jacoby, I really want to thank you for sharing not just your insane hacking skills, but also you sort of the motivation, you know, this, the story. I love hearing the stories about where people were and where they are today, because that motivates all of us. Because some of us, you know, may feel that, no, we're just not worthy. We can't do this. You know, we're not good enough. I really want to thank you that you took your bad situation. I mean, the, the stories that you've told me, it's rough, but you turned that into something really good to help the community. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, absolutely. You know, it, it's important for people to know that there are, you know, mean people out there, but there are so many more people out there that do care about you. They care about what you've went through. They might not always have the best thing to say or know what to say, but easily one of my biggest regrets I have has been not reaching out to the community sooner. Me thinking that I wasn't good enough or that I had to earn my right to yeah. just be liked on a base level. And it's not true, no matter no. You know, your insecurities, the imposter syndrome, the mean things that, you know, your inner monologue says about you, they're just not true. There's people out there that uh, that do care about you and, and uh, you should reach out to the community and you should try to, whatever community it is, if that you want to be a part of, just go say hi to someone. Just go, hey, I'm interested in what you do. You want to tell me about it? And you're about to make a friend. Part of buying the house I'm at now is I can legally tell people how many cats I have. Um, I've been <laughs> how many cats, you cats. I've been telling people for 10 years that I fostered them and I rehomed them and I lied. And uh, over the last 10 years, I've rescued and kept 37 cats that wow. are with both 36 are with me now. My oldest passed away. Um, that's Luther that's in my logo. But wow, yeah. dude, that is great.